Good afternoon and welcome back, everyone. Hope that you had a refreshing spring break and that uh, you're excited to be back for the start of classes. We've wasted no time in jump-starting the second leg of the spring semester with a terrific, exciting new uh, lecture series that we're inaugurating here today at Gordon College, and we're delighted to have a very special guest delivering the inaugural lecture in that series. But first, let me offer a little bit of background on the uh, series that we're launching here. The Richard F. Gross Distinguished Lecture Series is named in honor of Gordon's sixth president. Dr. Gross guided Gordon College through its 100th anniversary in 1989 and to the cusp of the 21st century, leading the college in major expansions in nearly every aspect of its work. After joining the college as dean in 1967, Dick Gross assumed the presidency of Gordon in 1976. During the next decade and a half, Dick Gross placed a strong emphasis on faculty growth and development, on cultivating the types of engagement opportunities that we actually are showcasing here today, establishing Gordon at the very forefront of cultural conversation as we confront the issues of our day with an emphasis on reasoned and respectful discourse. Dick Gross retired from the Gordon College presidency in 1992, and it's our privilege to acknowledge and preserve his legacy through this very special lecture series which we launch today. Dick is here with his wife, Jody, which we are very grateful for, as well as members of the family. May I just ask, uh, Dick and Jody, would you mind please standing for us to recognize you? Dick and Jody, we love you, and uh, we're glad to have you here. It's my pleasure now to introduce our distinguished speaker to launch the Richard F. Gross Distinguished Lecture Series. Senator John Kerry is the senior senator from Massachusetts and the second longest serving senator in his seat. He is the sixth most senior Democrat in the Senate and holds senior positions on the Finance, Commerce, and Small Business Committees. He also serves as chair of the Foreign Relations Committee. Senator Kerry is a veteran who served for two tours of duty in Vietnam. For his leadership and courage and sacrifice under fire, he was decorated with a silver star, a bronze star, and three purple hearts. John Kerry was elected Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts in 1982. Two years later, he was elected to the United States Senate, and he has been re-elected four times since, now serving in his fifth term in the U.S. Senate. In 2003, John Kerry announced that he would make a bid for the White House, and he went on to mount a come-from-behind campaign that ended up winning the Democratic nomination. Today in the U.S. Senate, he continues fighting for those things that motivated him to enter into public life in the first place, love of country and call of duty. In his life of public service, John Kerry is sustained by his family. He's married to Teresa Hines Kerry. They have a blended family that includes two daughters, three sons, two grandkids, and I hear two dogs as well. As many of you know, Senator Kerry sent a very warm and gracious uh, congratulatory note on the occasion of my inauguration in September. And it was that letter that prompted our invitation to the Senator to come to Gordon today. He has chosen the title of his topic to be On Faith, so will you now please join me in giving a warm Gordon College welcome to Senator John Kerry. Thank you, thank you very, very much. Thank you for a very warm welcome uh, on a very warm day. Uh, <laughs> I was just commenting to the president that it felt like more like one of those soft October uh, days that you get before the worst is to come, and now at least we know the best is about to come because two days from now, a winter is officially over. So we're happy about that. Uh, those of you, I, I'm looking at some of these tans. You guys, welcome back from spring break. Uh, I didn't get a spring break. I'm jealous, uh, very jealous. Anyway, I trust you stayed out of jail and other places. Um, but uh, 
it's very special for me to be able to be here uh, at this inaugural lecture, an inaugural address. I always wanted to give an inaugural address. So, I mean, I, <laughs> you know, well, but, you know. Let, let history and the record books record it happened at Gordon College. <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, well, anyway, it's, it's uh, uh, Richard Gross, thank you for the privilege of delivering your first inaugural address, and thank you for your uh, great leadership here, uh, not just the growth of the physical plan of the college, but obviously uh, its reputation for academic excellence and uh, uh, here and abroad, I might add. So I congratulate you on that, and it's a privilege to be here to share thoughts with all of you. It's also a privilege as a uh, elected member of the United States Congress, uh, <laughs> looking at the way the Congress is working these days, it's a wonder that anybody gets invited anywhere. Um, I was walking through an airport not so long ago and I saw this fellow clearly recognize me as I was going through. And uh, you've learned after a certain number of years in public life as to whether or not you kind of sense friendly or foe, and you, you, you kind of decide whether you put your head down and just plow right through the place and pretend you didn't hear or you respond. Well, in this case, I had no choice. The guy yells, hey, you, hey, you, anybody ever tell you you look like that Kerry guy we sent down to Washington? <laughs> so I, I tell him politely, they tell me that all the time, sir. <laughs> to which he says, kind of makes you mad, don't it? <laughs> So, uh, you know, I want you to know that I come here uh, with, with all the appropriate humility. Uh, but I'm on, I really am happy to share some thoughts with you. I know this is called a lecture. Lecture is a very imposing term. So I want you to begin to think about this maybe as a conversation. Uh, uh, certainly, I want to talk with you and share some thoughts, uh, some of which I shared a little bit in the letter that I wrote to, at the President's inauguration. But it's a special privilege to be here at this college, and I'll tell you why. Because Wenham, as those of you studying history and others have learned perhaps, and this whole area, uh, from here through Boston, obviously, uh, has played such a special part in the power of faith as a key element uh, of the history and the intellectual foundation of the state of Massachusetts and indeed our country. Uh, from the pilgrims, from, from the Great Awakening, and I will share with you that my great-grandfather to the tenth, I think it is, was a fellow by the name of John Winthrop, who was the first governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and occasionally a somewhat excessive uh, Puritan. Uh, and uh, so I, I know something of this historically. And if I went back to college today, I was a political science major. I hope I'm not destroying the political science department here by saying this. But I would probably make sure, at least as a minor, that I studied comparative religion and perhaps even as a major. Uh, because what I've learned as chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee and in 28 years on the service uh, thereon, as I travel, I literally yesterday was in Doha and Dubai uh, meeting with the Emir uh, and, and the Prime Minister to talk about Syria and uh, Iran. Uh, and as I spend more and more time at that, I'm more aware of the cross currents and foundational challenges of what people believe, and particularly today, what they believe about God. Uh, and, and religion. And it is true that, you know, here in this area, from the pilgrims to the Great Awakening to the great movements for social justice, uh, the civil rights movement, the peace movement, environment, women's movement, all of these originated among many of the religious-based campuses uh, and in the faith-based communities of our state. And this area has contributed both citizens and conscience uh, to those struggles through the years. So Gordon College is an institution that is explicitly 
uh, founded to shine the light of God's truth, as we call it, uh, through the service of you when you graduate and whatever you choose to do as you go on and make your lives. It's a thoughtful community that cares about the place of faith in public life. Though, as I learned in my discussion a few minutes ago with the president, perhaps only 10% of you may go on into ministry or into some other faith-based endeavor on a full-time basis, but all of you, I promise you, will carry at least the questions, if not the answers, with you for a lifetime. The, the discussion of faith uh, in the middle of a presidential election year is fraught with uh, many pitfalls. Uh, but perhaps that's an added incentive for all of us, no matter where you come from in the political spectrum, right, left, center, conservative, liberal, uh, it's important that we try to find ways to translate our faith and our values into efforts that unify for a greater good rather than divide for shallower purposes. I think uh, President Lindsay understands better than most the nexus between God and power in modern America. And if you read his book, Faith in the Halls of Power, I'm sure it's available uh, in the school bookstore, and if it ain't, it will be, I'm sure, very quickly. Uh, it becomes clear how serious evangelicals are about bringing their worldview to the workplace and how they are literally called to certain careers rather than simply choosing a career, and how they use their careers as a ministry and an extension of their faith. Now, I understand that. I like to think, I don't want to be excessively presumptuous, but I like to think that my entire career in public life has been extension of my faith and what I learned uh, as a young person growing up uh, in a faith-based community of a kind. Uh, and over the last years, I've met with faith-based leaders from all over the world. Spoke not so long ago, I think a couple of years ago, with, uh, with uh, former Prime Minister Tony Blair and others at a faith-based gathering of both 68 fundamentalist Islamic leaders who came together to meet at Yale with about 68 to 70 uh, American evangelical leaders, including Dr. Robert Schiller and other great well-known leaders. And that experience only reaffirmed my personal sense, or my, 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 I guess my sense of purpose in life, to borrow uh, a concept from a well-known author, minister. But it also confirmed this, and this is what is important. And I believe this more and more each trip I make to the Middle East or to uh, Pakistan or Afghanistan or to a troubled country. And that is that there is much more that we hold in common than that which divides us. And honest discussions ought to only draw us closer to that understanding. As Gandhi once said, the world's religions are beautiful flowers from the same garden. I was just speaking personally for a minute. I was born and baptized and raised a Catholic. And needless to say, my first and formative sense of religion came from my parents. Uh, my mother was a Protestant. It was a blended marriage in that sense. Uh, and many of her family and our family still live around this particular area. In fact, I grew up around here as a kid, living in uh, Hamilton, Ipswich for a while. Uh, and my mother, however, undertook her obligation, committed to my father as a Catholic, to raise the kids as a Catholic, so I learned my catechism and attended church and prepared for First Communion, and both my parents taught me early on that we're all put on this earth for something greater than ourselves. And they taught me my faith, as did others of the next years, because I went on to become an altar boy in my church. I went to a high school in New Hampshire, a prep school as they call it, a place called St. Paul's, an Episcopal school where we attended chapel every single morning, twice on Sundays, 
in addition to the Catholic service, which I would attend going into Concord, New Hampshire, along with the rest of, as we were called or nicknamed, the mackerel snappers back then. I studied religious studies, uh, and as you would imagine, in a school called St. Paul's, I became pretty familiar with St. Paul's letters to just about everybody. <laughs> During the Vietnam War, uh, my faith was as much a part of my daily life as the battle itself. And when I had to confront my own mortality, I did what you might expect. I prayed hard, just like you do before exams. <laughs> they say there are no atheists in a foxhole. And I came to understand that. They're right. But I will tell you that I, you know, I even wore my rosary on my neck and I cut deals with God, get me through this and I'll do this and this and this. And I must say I entered into a sort of daily debate uh, with respect to what we were doing and why we were doing it. Uh, and in retrospect, my relationship with God at that point in my life was pretty transactional, uh, as I just described to you. So I made it through, and the war kind of tested my faith. Uh, some of my closest friends from college and high school were killed, and I saw things that disturbed me to this day, and some of them we still see played out in Afghanistan or Pakistan or Syria or other places. I came face to face with the problem that theologians call the problem of evil. The difficulty of explaining why terrible things could possibly part, be part of God's plan. In combat, you confront the problem of evil in a close-up and a personal way, and it's very hard for other people to fully understand it. When I came back, I really didn't reconcile all that I had been through very easily. And I think I went through a period that many people go through at one point or another, and some stay in it, which is a period of alienation, a period of big questions. I found inspiration in the Christian moral witness of people like Dr. Martin Luther King, because this was, after all, the 1960s. Uh, Reverend William Sloan Coffin, uh, in the peace movement, and other voices of Christian conscience. If you read the letter from a Birmingham jail, one of the most amazing documents I've ever read politically, it is filled with that sense of scripture and moral compulsion. Uh, so, yeah, I was sort of spiritually trying to figure things out, unsure of my relationship with God and with the regimen of church. For 12 years or so, I kind of drifted around like that. I went through a divorce. I struggled with questions about the direction of my life. And then suddenly and relatively movingly, I had a re revelation about the connection between the work I was doing as a public person, public servant, and my formative teachings. It was nothing as dramatic as Paul on the road to Damascus, but I found I found meaning in scriptures that I hadn't seen before in such a way that provided a firmer guide about the values that applied to my life, probably things that many of you are wrestling with even now. I remember even how difficult it is to sort of sit where you are now, looking at the future that seems a little out of your control, a little out of your reach, but it's still right around the corner and you're trying to figure out and decide a lot of big decisions about career, future, uh, choices that are not insignificant. Uh, I might add that uh, there's always a challenge about how you translate these things into your daily existence. There's a passage from the scripture, a familiar story from the gospel, uh, according to Mark, that sheds a lot of light on how I came to sort of see that translation of faith into action. And i just share it with you very quickly. I think I may have included some of this in the letter that I wrote uh, to President Lindsay, but uh, it bears repeating because I think it's uh, part of this journey. Uh, Jay, you, you, some of you may recall that, that James and John ask their teacher Jesus if they can sit 
one at the right hand and one at the left hand, and essentially bask in his glory. And they want to be seen as the first among disciples. And Jesus tells them while they can, sh they can drink from his cup and share in the baptism, the special position that they want is not his to grant. It's only for those who are up to the task, who qualify. And when the other ten disciples heard about James and John's request, they were really angry. And so Jesus gathered them all together and they say, he said to them, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lorded over them. But it's not so among you, but whoever wishes to be first among you must be servant of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as ransom for the many. So I suppose in a certain way you could say that James and John tried hard to be the first political appointees, uh, in the New Testament at least, trying to get special favor for their proximity to power. But Jesus wouldn't have any of it. He responded with a basic lesson. He, 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 he contrasts greatness in the kingdom of God with Roman political power, i.e., Roman political power, greatness was based on brute force, lording it over those who are less fortunate for the worst possible reason, uh, simply because you can. Greatness in the kingdom of God, at least by my interpretation, uh, came on humble service, being a servant to all. Now, frankly, those lines actually had a profound impact on me, and they still do. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And I consider public service. I always have. I think this grows out of my teachings at St. Paul's School, and I'm sure it will come out of your teachings here at Gordon College, that, that it is a form of Christian service, and it is a form of expression of faith. To me, far more important on a day-to-day -day basis than proclaiming it on a television show or using it in a debate or somehow asserting it in a way that tries to divide people. I believe that the most important teachings, and, and think about it, you know, the entire ministry of Jesus was what, three years? Began when he was 30 years old, ended when he was 33, pretty short time. And he went out there and he basically did things and, and urged us to do things. And so I've always believed that if you're going to believe in him and do the things that he told you to do, you have to take action. It's not passive, it's active. And you have to live in that example. And I believe that screams out at you. And my colleague, Ted Kennedy, <coughs> he and I talked frequently about, about this kind of thing, as I do with other Catholic senators. Believe it or not, we talk about this. And <coughs> all of us, I think, are hugely uh, inspired, motivated by Matthew 25. You know it well. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked, you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. So the question for all of us is how do you move from that to this world we live in today and do it in a way that doesn't repel people, doesn't push them away from you, doesn't make them think you're a you know, a fanatic or somehow out of touch or living uh, some other kind of life, but where people of every faith can sort of draw on that kind of concept. Well, uh, it seems to me that we all, that's where I think about this comparative religion piece. The more I learn, and I take time to read some of the Koran, I urge you to, or go read the Torah, uh, or Confucius, or learn something about Hinduism and, uh, or even Native American philosophy about life on earth. All of it. 
live by basically universal values that are reflected in each and every scripture. And, and the much of it, interestingly enough, tries to address global issues of poverty, disease, and despair. In fact, today, poverty shackles the aspirations of one-sixth of the population of this planet, now seven billion people. One-fifth of the planet lacks access to safe drinking water. 30,000 children worldwide perish every day because of hunger and disease attributable directly to poverty. And when I go to the Middle East today, I, I look at this challenge of Egypt, of Syria, of these places, all of which have a population of 60% under the age of 25, 50% under the age of 21, 40% under the age of 18, and none of them have an adequate education or a job opportunity in their lives. And if we don't all make that our issue, I promise you, some mullah or imam or cleric who is a Wahhabi or Salafist is going to grab them and preach violence and blame the failure of their own absence of governance on us because we have so much. Now, some people inevitably ask the question, you know, the easiest line, the easiest applause line in American politics is to stand up in front of an audience and say, I don't believe we ought to be sending that money over to those folks. We ought to be spending it right here in Wenham. Yay, everybody goes nuts. <laughs> but it does matter to us. It matters to us in practical terms. It matters to us in moral terms. It matters to us as a matter of faith and conscience. It also matters to us, I think, as a matter of practical common sense. So, it seems to me that, uh, that, that the Judeo-Christian, Islamic continuity is that they're all Abrahamic faiths. They all believe in the same God. Much of one scripture is taken from another scripture, or from the oral stories, since much of what was written down came from the oral tradition of those times. And so, when Jesus said to us, whatever you do to the least of these, you do unto me, I think he meant that nobody should be left behind. No American, no country, no human being. And if you, I mean, as you do, and because I know you have some required courses here that require you to do this, uh, as, as, as Pastor Rick Warren once said, before he wrote The Purposeful Life, uh, he wrote about, uh, he, in fact, I had this conversation with him once, and he said to me, you know, I went to the seminary, I studied for 20 years, I, I read Greek, I read this, I read that. How did I miss poverty? That, those were his words to me. He couldn't believe that he had left that up because every page, every other thing, I think uh, something like... Uh, uh, you know, one out of every 16 verses is about the poor. And throughout the gospel, Jesus is constantly pressing the rich and the well-off in ways that ought to challenge us today, frankly, on the widening gap between rich and poor in our own country. So I think we have a long way to climb up. And I think a lot of politicians who run around talking about this need to stop and really examine uh, more realistically, what that responsibility really is. Uh, each of us could do something about this. I have to tell you, you know, it's uh, the epistle of St. James remind us starkly that, that faith without works is dead. Uh, and that's what I mean about saying that, you know, it's not enough just to say, I believe this, I believe that, if you don't live it and act it in any way whatsoever. So, you can see this in a lot of ways, and I think there, there are ways for us to bring this to light. For instance, you can see this in the millions of people of faith who have been moved to action by Coney 2012, which shows the monstrous acts of Joseph Coney and the Lord's Resistance Army, 
uh, and a 25-year 25 25-year 25 campaign of terror where the outside world has not been able to say no, the abduction of thousands of children uh, to use as soldiers or as sex slaves in the jungles of Africa. Uh, Christians have also joined front and center in the fight against AIDS, uh, rather than just sitting by. And, and, and today there are 34 million cases, including 3.4 million children. Last year, 1.8 million people died from this scourge. And I would remind you that Jesus didn't just heal the sick if they had the money to pay for it. Uh, he made sure that he sought out people in need. We need to do the same. Another common challenge, I think, where we can unite in our faiths across the board is uh, protecting God's first creation. Throughout the Bible, we are called to stewardship of the earth. Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians 10.20 says, the earth is the Lord's and everything on it. And God said to the prophet Isaiah, has not my hand made all these things? And so they came into being. And through Leviticus chapter 25, God reminds us that we are tenants on his earth. And he gives us this command that throughout the country that you hold as a possession, you must provide for the redemption of the land. We face biblical problems today in terms of drought, fire, earthquake, various challenges to breeding grounds, the oceans, the bleaching of coral, the absolute decimation of almost every major fishery on the planet. I used to be chairman of the Subcommittee on Fisheries in the Senate, and I know well what is happening to our own fisheries as well as others. Almost every major fishery is outfished because there's too much money chasing too few fish. So I believe that confronting man-made global climate change, there are 6,000, count them, 6,000 peer-reviewed studies that say man is contributing to the increasing warming of the earth. There is not one, not one, zero studies to the contrary that supports what the doubters are saying. The Koch brothers, who are now famous, recently hired a scientist to try to prove their theory that it's a hoax, and guess what? Their hired scientist came back and said, no, it's happening and it's real and we have to respond to it. So it might be nice, I mean, it's not might be, sure it's nice not to have uh, the bills and the town doesn't have to do the plowing and uh, we didn't have to face a brutal winter. But wait till this summer. Look at the tornado that already hit in the south. Look at the drought that we've had in parts of our country for the last 10 or 15 years. Ask the park service people in Yellowstone and Yosemite parks what is happening as species are migrating north where it's warmer. Look at millions of acres of trees that have been destroyed in Colorado, Montana, Canada because of the pine bark beetle that doesn't die now in the fall because it doesn't get as cold as it used to be. I'm a kid who grew up playing hockey around here on black ice ponds back in the 1950s and 60s. You can't do that anymore, barely. They don't freeze over. In fact, in Canada, there was an article in the newspaper just the other day about how Canada is now not having all their lakes and ponds freeze over in the winter. Just last week, we learned that rising sea levels caused by global warming by the middle of this century will make coastal flooding a common occurrence in the United States. One of the researchers described the sea level rise as an invisible tsunami. So here's the bottom line. Here's what I want to close saying to all of you. Surely these are issues where people of common faith can come together and demand action. Uh, you know, perhaps the most compelling place where we ought to be able to do that is on this issue of respect for life and war and peace. Uh, you know, we're more than just Christians and Jews and Buddhists and Muslims or atheists. We're human beings. And our faiths and our fates are inextricably intertwined. It's a delusion to think 
that you can build higher walls, retreat to safer places. And the good news is, as I see it, that for all of the challenges that I've just described, all of the major religions share a sense of universal values about the dignity of human beings and respect for earth. Now, Christians have long struggled to balance the legitimate need for self-defense with the highest ideals of justice and personal morality, thou shalt not kill. St. Augustine laid the foundation for a compelling philosophical tradition considering how and when Christians should fight. The whole concept of justifiable killing and justifiable war. He felt that wars of choice are generally unjust wars and that war, the organized killing of human beings, of fathers and brothers and friends, always ought to be a last resort and that always ought to have a just cause and that those waging the war need the right authority to be able to do it. That a military response has to be proportionate to the provocation and that a war has to have a reasonable chance of achieving its goal and that it must discriminate between civilians and combatants. We thought enough of that after World War II to codify it and put it into laws of war, war crimes, The Hague, and created a court to try to advance this ideal. In developing that doctrine of just war, Augustine and many of his successors viewed self-restraint in warfare as a religious obligation, not a pious hope uh, contingent on convincing somebody to behave likewise. Uh, so for me, the war criteria are really very clear. Sometimes a president has to use force to fight an enemy bent on using weapons of mass destruction to slaughter innocent people. The confrontation that we have now with Iran, which we pray and hope will never get to a war, will certainly be based on a notion of justness given what we're trying to do in the effort uh, to prevent it. But no president should ever go to war because you want to. You go to war because you have to. And the words last resort have to mean something. I think particularly about the war in Iraq. Now, people of faith, many of you here don't have to agree with me about how you keep America safe, uh, how you prevail over terrorists. But I do hope we could agree that stepping up to the challenge of rejecting the idea that obedience to God somehow stops when the fighting begins. So I think we need a revival of what constitutes just war, how they ought to be conducted, and all people of faith, whatever their, their allegiance, ought to participate in this debate. One of the things that's happened is the loss of the draft, which we faced. We had a draft. You got out of college and you didn't have much choice until finally there was a lottery. The absence of a draft has actually relieved the pressure from too much of America to share in the defense of America. And the result is that you look at the economic demographics of our military who are extraordinary, amazing people who have done amazing things on behalf of our country. But I'd like to see more of our country share in that responsibility. And whatever our, our differences in the end about you know, monotheistic religions, let me just say to you that, and I see this with, when I talk with I have some great friends in the Middle East now who are strong Islamists, but they're not radicals. They're not extremists. They believe in peace and in coexistence and in the tolerance and individual rights, even as they practice their religion. And they would share with me that every single one of us should be celebrating that we all believe in one God. We all ought to put worship above all these other things that are used to divide us. And we ought to welcome the secular among us to join in celebrating our common awe at the majestic fact of the universe we inhabit, however it may have originated. You cannot look up at that incredible sky at night and look into a black hole 
into which matter moves at hundreds of thousands of miles an hour and nobody knows where it goes, you can't look at that or think about it and not ask some serious questions. So we don't have to agree on everything in order to get along. But somehow we have to agree that faith may be worth dying for, but it isn't worth killing for. We have to strive for a global ethic that allows each of our religious faiths to express themselves fully, but allows us to unite around a common ethical ground. Remember this. When Jesus was asked, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? He replied, first, you shall love the Lord your God. And second, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. In everything, he said, do unto others what you would have them do unto you, which is, incidentally, the same thing you will find in almost every other religion that I've named here today. For, and, and then he says, for this sums up the law and the prophets. The Talmud says that in Roman times, a non-believer approached the famous rabbi, Rabbi Hillel, and he challenged him to, meet, to, to, to teach the meaning of the Torah while standing on one leg and holding up one foot. Guess what? Rabbi Hillel didn't hesitate. He stood up on one foot, on one leg only, and he replied, what is hateful to yourself, do not do to another. That is the whole of the Torah. All the rest is commentary. The prophet Muhammad said, not one of you truly believes until you wish for others what you wish for yourself. Buddhist scriptures say, treat not others in ways that you yourself would, not, would find hurtful. And Native American spirituality proclaims, all things are relatives, what we do to everything we do to ourselves. So my friends here at Gordon College this afternoon, I say to you, we are really more than the sum of our differences. We share a moral obligation to treat each other with dignity and respect, and I believe the history of Christianity uh, and this area tells us that. I told you in the beginning about John Winthrop. John Winthrop chased few people out of this state. Uh, the religious dissidents, people who didn't quite believe in his brand, ironically, having come from England to get away from intolerance, Roger Williams left Massachusetts over doctrinal differences. He wandered all through the woods south of Boston for the entire winter until he broke out on Narragansett Bay and discovered and called it Providence. That's why it's called Providence. And he built that state and his colony there. Thomas Hooker left Massachusetts for Connecticut, as did John Davenport. Today there's a college at Yale University called Davenport College. You know, all of these people today, all of these states are obviously more neighbors now than they were the differences back then, which tells you what this journey is really all about. So as you look out across America, I think you'll see, I hope you'll see after this, a country not just of white church steeples, but a country also of synagogues, of minarets, of Muslim mosques, of golden domes, of Sikh temples, of monasteries, Buddhist as well as Catholic, and I tell you uh, that in the end, uh, we can find this common ground. The divisions can be drawn out of the simple way in which some people choose to mix religion and politics. I have experience at that firsthand. So we have to stop drafting God into partisan service and start emphasizing the values that we share. And I just leave you, you know, the last, uh, uh, not usually, and say I don't usually, uh, and maybe it's evident in the course of it, but I don't usually talk about a personal journey like this or even uh, faith because, uh, you know, it, obviously it doesn't, something that every audience uh, wants to digest or even may digest. But I, I have a sense that, uh, uh, that the call of Jesus, the call of every religious leader, uh, is a call to service for everyone, not the pursuit of power. And each of us needs to do our best to answer that call and to help each other to hear it 
in a common spirit of obedience and humility, and in the end, and boy, do you find this throughout that three-year journey of Jesus, love. There's nothing he preached more than that. As the saying goes, as Rabbi Hillel said, all the rest is commentary. Thank you. Senator Kerry, thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yes. Can I invite you to take a seat? Yeah. Senator Kerry, on behalf of uh, my colleagues and the students of Gordon that. College, I have a small token of our appreciation we wanted to give to you. So thank you, thank very, you very much for being thank here. You. We're very grateful for thank that. You, sir. And uh, Senator Kerry, what we invited uh, folks here in the audience to text or email their questions in, and they are just rolling in. So um, I'll try and uh, figure out where to start. Let me just offer one. You, you mentioned uh, Joseph Coney. And uh, as I mentioned to you, uh, one of our uh, graduates actually had, uh, had written a book, uh, Grace Akalo had written a book about uh, her experience of being abducted as a child in Uganda and being forced into the Lord's Resistance Army. I wonder if you might just tell me uh, what's the Foreign Relations Committee wanting to do to try and uh, bring about justice in the situation and what word can you share for our students who are really concerned about this issue? Well, first of all, thank you for being, uh, I mean, it's, this is one of those great examples of something where your outrage and your uh, engagement can help make a difference. Uh, I mean, Coney 2012 obviously uh, is, is a testament to the remarkable power of the social media today, which we keep learning. We think we've learned it, and we keep learning more and more, but when you get several million hits as fast as you did on that, it's pretty compelling. Uh, your graduate author is lucky to be alive, number one, but more important is we all should be outraged that this has gone on for 25 years. Now, we now have 100 special forces troops who have actually been put into that area. Uh, President Obama sent them in. Uh, some people didn't like that fact, but uh, he did it in order to try to help assist the UN and other forces that are there on the ground trying to prevent this from happening. And I personally believe that uh, we ought to utilize some of our top technology uh, and, and um, really go to some lengths now to try to find this fellow and call him to, to justice. And the reason I don't think we should do it alone, I think we should do it in concert with, with the community that is there. But the reason is obvious. Uh, when you hold a tyrant accountable like that, uh, it's a critical message to to uh, you know, everybody. It's a message to that young fruit vendor uh, or people like him who, who gave his life in, in, in uh, Tunisia to start a revolution which started what happened in Egypt which, uh, and in Libya and so forth, and all of which is testimony to the power that uh, one individual can have, one hopes, not by self-immolation, uh, but it has sometimes taken that. Buddhist monks in Tibet who self-immolate in order to hold the Chinese government accountable for, uh, you know, atrocious cultural uh, uh, devastation in Tibet uh, and elsewhere in the world who, who, who fight out against injustice. Uh, so what we're going to do is hold some hearings on this at some point uh, in the Foreign Relations Committee. We're going to try to see if we can't uh, coordinate a stronger technological response to isolate and find where Joseph Coney may be and his, and his followers. You have to understand this is an area twice the size of Texas, all jungle, triple canopy, extraordinarily complicated, difficult territory. And, and you know, 10 people, let alone 100 people, let alone 1,000 people would have a hard time finding somebody in that, so it's not easy. But we do have terrific t 
technology today that has the ability to identify people from quite far away and to track them and to do other things. And I think we have to begin to apply that, obviously. One of the things that we're also going to have a hearing on, which I find, I mean, stunning in, in its uh, inhumanity, is human trafficking across the board, not just the problem of the LRA and the kids there, but the amount of human trafficking that takes place uh, globally uh, is really stunning. And countries that you'd think are civilized and ruled by law and order uh, are corrupted to some degree at certain times, and, and it takes place there. The abuse of women is just uh, indescribable. And so we have to continue to speak out and continue to work for that. And you can choose where and when and how and which issue. Unfortunately, there are too many of them. One of the things that has struck me, this is slightly off the 2012 uh, Coney thing, but it's linked to it. I have been dumbfounded uh, year to year as I go to country to country and confront issue after issue with the level of corruptions, of corruption. We in the United States of America really operate by a very different standard from most people, including some of our friends in Western Europe. Uh, we have something called the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, and we hold people accountable for bribery or for other kinds of things. But the level of corruption in some countries today, I find a, a real threat to global structure and law and order. And there are whole countries that are kleptocracies. And whole countries where, you know, take Robert Mugabe, for instance. Uh, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, stunning that he was able to pull off the theft of the presidency and continue on, notwithstanding his brutality and killings and everything else. So we have a ways to go. Now, on the upside, and there is an upside, I think things are changing. I think that's what's going on in what I call the Arab awakening. I don't know if it's a spring yet, but it's certainly an awakening. And the, the internet and social media and globalization, financially, jobs, uh, the integration of the world. I mean, here I am, I'm in Dubai last night, I'm here today. That's pretty standard fare nowadays in today's world. And the degree to which we are living out you know, sort of our joint history, I think is compelling more and more accountability in politics. I think the days of these despots are, are you know, numbered. I can't tell you it's not in necessarily months or years, maybe even not in a decade or so, but I guarantee you this century is going to see the greatest transition to a kind of accountability from citizens, from average people uh, that we have ever seen. And in the end, that's where the Joseph Coney's and the others uh, will become less, not more. But the key to it, my friends, is providing opportunity and sharing wealth intelligently through your social structure so that everybody can come along and share. Not everybody expects to get rich, but everybody expects a fair shot at the best opportunity possible, and a decent life, and playing by the rules, and a decent shot. And, and you'd be amazed, you know, you can be very content uh, with, with not a lot if you're safe, if your family can have food, and you have an opportunity to perhaps have an education and go on and make your best opportunities. So I think that uh, that's what the Coney thing is all about. And if you pick that one battle, and we go win it, that's going to help us move on all of these others. And it's all connected, and that's the most important thing to remember. I remind you, I'm sorry to take a minute, but I remind you, in 1970, when I came back from Vietnam, my first initiatives were not on the war. I was sort of taking a little time to sort all of that through. I knew I hated it, and I knew I was opposed to it, but I didn't yet know how to translate it into a political action. But I did get involved right away in something called Earth Day, which in 1970 saw 20 million Americans organize around this one day where they were going to come out and show the political leadership that they didn't want to drink water from poisoned wells. 
They didn't want to live next to a dump that gave their kids cancer. They didn't want to watch the Cuyahoga River in Ohio literally light on fire. You had fires because of their stuff, junk, burning in the river. So these 20 million people came out, but they didn't stop there. They translated that one day into political activity. And they went out and targeted the 12 worst voters in the United States Congress on the issue of the environment. And in the next election, this was 1972, seven of the 12 were beaten. Guess what happened? Every survivor went, oh my God, this thing has clout. These people mean business. And Congress turned around and in the span of two years passed the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Marine Mammal, Mammal Protection Act, the Coastal Zone Management Act, and we created the EPA in the United States of America. Until then, we didn't even have an environmental protection agency in America. It came out of grassroots energy. And you know where most of that grassroots energy came from? Students. In college at the time, some of whom took a term off and went out and organized, and they helped make that change happen. I promise you, nowhere on the face of this planet can people as easily, as safely, go out and just start doing something like that and organize and make a difference. And remember that. That is the wonderful blessing uh, that we have in this country, different from everybody else on the planet. So, Senator Kerry, I know you have a very full schedule. Uh, if I could just, I've got, the questions are rolling in. If I could just get a couple of questions okay, off Okay, I'll give you. you a quick, short answer. Okay, so, <laughs> thank you. So, uh, one set of questions, you're, a lot of students are, are saying that they see resonance between your Catholic faith and your position on, say, environmental stewardship and creation care <clears throat> that you've talked eloquently about. One question that they, they're also wondering about uh, relates to the issue of abortion. So one of the things that you said in the 2004 election is that uh, you didn't want to allow or have your faith necessarily shape your public direction on issues of uh, the abortion question. But the question is, how do you square this with the Christian teaching that faith ought to inform all of our life? Well, it should inform all of your life, and I don't disagree with that, and it does inform mine. I, I would urge people to, I believe life begins at conception, and I would teach that to somebody. And I would personally argue against abortion, and I would say to people, don't have it or don't try to have it. And I think our policy publicly ought to be that you make it as rare as possible. But as President Clinton used to frame it, it should be rare, but it should be safe and legal. And the reason for that is that if it isn't, many people make the argument that well, there are a number of arguments. One is that you wind up with a lot, you know, with much more danger to women. You go back to the days of back alley, you know, under the radar abortions, uh, people die, all kinds of things happen. That's number one. Number two, I will, I will show you that when you do the things that I talk about doing, which is making sure kids have adequate supervision, after school programs, uh, summer jobs, counseling, an adult in their life in the evening uh, to help them with their homework, help them get through a troubled family situation, whatever it is, if you do those kinds of things, you will reduce the number of abortions. And every cycle of presidencies where you've had a presidency that comes down hard and says, we're not gonna fund this or we're not gonna have uh, teaching or we're not, you know, whatever it is, you wind up with more abortions. Every time you join together in the effort to be educated about it, even as you tell people you shouldn't have one or it's wrong, ultimately, who's going to make that decision? I don't, no matter what I teach or no matter what you believe or I believe, I don't think the decision should be made by, you know, as it has been most of the past, by a bunch of white men deciding what women are going to do. But now it's changed somewhat. We have women on the Supreme Court, and we have more people in public life of other, you know, both genders. But you should hear the women in the Senate talk about this. There's just a passionate belief that the, the courts and the government should not be making that decision, that no matter how 
complicated it is morally, and no matter what your personal beliefs, ultimately, it's a choice that ought to be made within that zone of privacy between a woman, her doctor, and God, and obviously husband and family. Now, that's where I came out. And I don't think there's an inconsistency at all in that. I, I will believe what I believe, and I'll bring it to the public sector. And I think our language, I've learned about this, I think the language of the abortion debate, and I think I was somewhat, you know, I, you know, mea culpa about that in my early part of my career. I don't think I was as sensitive to it. I think you have to, you know, it's, you can't just run around and say, it's my body and I can do whatever I want with it. There has to be a greater moral weight in all of that. And I think the language of the debate has sometimes separated itself from the kinds of things I just talked about. So we need to have a civil discussion about it. But in the end, I do believe that it's inappropriate for me to make the decision for my wife or for somebody else or my daughter. Senator Kerry, how do you, uh, how do you adjudicate the tension between being a, uh, a known Christian, active Catholic, and your uh, public responsibility to people of no faith or of different faiths. So you, one approach can be sort of a water it down where we're all the same, but I know from things that you've said and things you've written that you don't actually believe that. So how do you represent faithfully your own, your own Christian conviction while at the same time representing the concerns of constituents who are really opposed to those convictions? Well, because everybody, well, first of all, as I pointed out, the key is tolerance, openness. Uh, who knows who has it all right? I mean, faith is what? The evidence of things unseen that you believe. That's what faith is. But you can't jam at somebody and say, I know my faith is absolutely, I mean, you can't do that. Everybody, you know, you have to have space for everybody to believe and act out, as long as it isn't injurious and uh, uh, abusive of other people and their rights. That's why we have the Constitution we have. That's why we have the Bill of Rights that we have. That is truly what is so beautiful about this country. It's what's so amazing about that document that they almost did as an afterthought. It's really the heart of the, of, of, of the rights that we have in our, in, our, in our lives. And if you respect those, whether you're an atheist or a Buddhist or Confucius, whatever, I can sit for hours listening to somebody talk to me about Islam or Buddhism or whatever, and it's fascinating to me. And I want to know why they think, how do they think it, et cetera. But then I think you try to find the common ground as a matter of basic, rational discussion about the secular side of things. That's why we try, that's why we don't allow the uh, adoption of any particular religion in this country. That is what the First Amendment is about, freedom of religion, freedom of choice. And you're free to do anything, including being an atheist. And we shouldn't penalize people for those things. There are bigger things to fight about and, and, and more things to bring us together in common to worry about right now like, you know, how's the next generation going to work? What are they going to work at? What's going to provide the economic foundation for a society challenged by a lot of other countries that don't play by the same rules? Uh, you know, how are we going to save the planet Earth from the scourge of uh, global climate change and carbon dioxide and all the poisons we put in the air? You know, there are 80,000 different chemicals in the marketplace. Did you know that? 80,000 chemicals you can go out there and buy. Only 6,000 of them have been approved by the FDA. People are putting stuff on their skin every single day, and half the people don't have any sense what it is. And you can get cancer from it and other kinds of things. There are a lot of things to worry about, folks, without challenging somebody's personal core beliefs in, a, in, a, in, a, in an ugly, sort of, I know better way. And that's how I reconcile it. Tolerance, openness, belief in our Bill of Rights and Constitution, and in the right of everybody to have their beliefs. It's very simple. Last two questions, very serious questions. Um, who do you Are think the Red Sox going to win? No, uh, well, I, better. March Madness. <laughs> oh, man, my, my, my bracket is so destroyed. I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I know. Anybody here? Who didn't have Missouri? Anybody here didn't have Missouri? You don't have a bracket. I don't know. 
Uh, I hate, uh, I, Kentucky's gonna win it. Sorry, folks. Mm. That's where we are. All right, last question, Mr. Kerry. If there's one bit of counsel you would give to our students of how they might stretch their minds and deepen their faith, what's something that's been meaningful to you in your own journey that you think you would encourage our students to uh, pursue as they try to live lives of more faithful leadership? Ask a lot of questions, listen to the answers, listen to other people, and believe in yourself. Trust your gut, and if your gut's connected to your heart, you're in great shape. Okay, please join me in thanking Senator Kerry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.